Sunday. Brought to you by the Mazda CX-3. Tonight on Sunday, from top cop to rock bottom. He was yelling and screaming. Every time police spoke to him, he'd come out shooting. The class clown who became our top police negotiator. Straight away you go, oh, crap. What have I done? He loved the job, but still, it haunts him. Sorry. And he's face to face with a man police shot. This country has got an epidemic, and Lance is part of the healing. Yes, yes, I think most people know that I do have influence. The power of two women cleaning up war's brutal aftermath. It was a woman who'd been macheted in her neck by her brother-in-law because his lunch wasn't ready on time. Two women are fighting for their lives after being severely burnt in a bushfire while running an ultra-marathon in Western Australia. First, she ran into a bushfire. I just thought this is what it's like to die in a fire. Then, she dreamed of competing in a foot race across the Sahara Desert. Kia ora, I'm Miriam McCummell. Tonight's story I find extraordinary. A rare and powerful insight into the life of a top police officer. Lance Burdett was the negotiator, called when lives hung in the balance. But while he fought to protect, he was losing a battle against himself. Tonight that struggle is laid bare. And he reveals new details about the deadly Napier siege which left his colleague dead. Here's Jahan Castaneda and a warning some material may be confronting. As you're walking towards any situation, your brain is racing flat out. What's going to happen in this one? I call it the long, lonely walk. The long, lonely walk. There's no one else around you. Time doesn't matter. You don't hear the traffic. You don't hear anything except your voice. Lance Burdett talks to those who are inches away from death. I'm thinking, what am I going to say to this person? One slip of the tongue could cause somebody to fall or jump. Your stomach is in your mouth, so you take the big deep breath. It is really an intense moment. But while helping others battle their demons, Lance was fighting his own. And eventually you have to put a shield in front of it, otherwise it's going to take you down. Before he joined the force, Lance was a cheeky kid from out west. What were you like in your younger days? Be honest. Uh, a <laughs> bit of a rat bag, actually. I discovered fairly early on that I couldn't learn very well, so I became the class clown. I left school with no qualifications. And I had a very good job as a builder. I was earning relatively good money. Money to pay for this. I've done lots of adventure sports. I do like the adrenaline rush. There's one rush he'd craved his whole life. I've always wanted to be a police officer. I think every kid does. At the age of 35, she decided, well, now or never. I didn't join the police to make a difference. I wanted to have a bit of excitement for myself. But he was in for a shock. The excitement turned to fear. Yelling and screaming at each other. You put a female shelter. You only see bad things, particularly at night time. He's just hit me! He's just hit me! Just wait, just wait, just Domestic incidents were uh, the worst for me. We were probably going to two or three a night. Her brother-in-law just came here with an axe. What does that do to your mind? Well, you do become quite desensitised. In fact, I think I became a little hard. You actually go out hunting. You're going out to see how many people you can lock up to save the rest of the country. But behind the bravado, Lance was a very different man. I've always been, not so much weak, uh, sensitive. Good girl. Especially after starting a family. Being a dad, you've got that paternal instinct. You relate things back to your own life. He was unprepared for the toughest part of police work, dealing with the dead. I used to look at their faces and you see a person and you can't imagine that that person is gone. One night, an ordinary call-out would really hit home. As I walked up the driveway, I could hear this wailing and screaming from the, from the bedroom. And, uh... Sorry. And I opened the door, and the mother was on the bed. 
She just looked up at me and she had nothing in her eyes. Her baby had died from cot death. I looked at her and I said, I don't know what to say. Here's a mother holding a baby to her breast who's dead. <sighs> that was the start of my demise, I guess. The perception of police is incorrect. Tough, strong, no, they are vulnerable. But instead of leaving the force, Lance pushed away the pain and rose through the ranks. The armour goes up. You start to feel self-important. You start to feel that you're invincible. Now a senior detective. I think the secret lies in the scene. He had to deal with a new kind of pressure. It's absolutely petrifying being in front of the cameras. We are in the process of reconstructing that vehicle. Cops are seen as robots. And there's a reason for that. One, we're nervous. Two, we're not sure what to say. And three, if I stick to the script, I'm OK, I'm safe. He led the charge on big cases, but told his boss he was overworked. They just basically said, um, sometimes you just need to dig it in. You know, we're all busy. You will get through this. Suck it up. Yeah, I was always trying to beat the other detective sergeants, always trying to have the greatest results. So I'd have you know, 10, 11, 12 hour days and then go to the gym for an hour, sometimes two hours. Do you do sort of isolate yourself from your family? Alcohol has that wonderful feeling of it just numbs you immediately. As much as Lance tried to escape the darkness of frontline policing, he couldn't. It's very difficult to, to wash this stuff off. This stuff sticks to you, it stays in your brain. I couldn't get to sleep at night. So I'd be taking pills all the time. It just made it so easy to get to sleep. Lance ignored the warning signs and took on an even bigger role. I'd just become a negotiator. On this bridge, he approached a teenage boy. Um, he was right on the end of his fingertips and he was leaning out with his leg. I've said to him, you know, look, I've, I've been in dark places too and you can get through this. It's really important that you stick with me. The boy eventually climbed off the bridge. Your heart is doing backflips. It really is. You're just, you're over the moon. It's the kind of work Lance had dreamed of, but it meant he had little time for his own family. Mum said, have you got time for a cup of tea? You know, time for a chat, I think she said. And I said, no, Mum, I'm busy. So she smiled and said, OK. And uh, she died the next day from a brain hemorrhage. And my brain just said, really? You busy? We'll have some of this. About two weeks after her funeral, I was driving home and it just hit me. The floodgates opened and I just cried and cried and cried. I had a knot in my stomach and I couldn't get rid of it. I would often yell, just breathe. Once again, he tried to push through. I recall standing at the photocopier on the fourth floor of the police station. I just thought this pain is just, I can't take it anymore. And I looked out the window and it was just a, a fleeting thought, it's not high enough. And I thought, what was that? How did that feel? Ah, uh, scared the hell out of me. And then I thought, gee, there's something that's not right here. And it was that very afternoon that I went and got some help. Lance was diagnosed with accumulated stress disorder. In other words, burnout. It's like coming out of a, a wave when you're getting bowled over in the surf and it takes you down and sucks you under and you think, that's all right, I'll come back up, I'll pop back up any time. Just relax. And it hits you in the face again and says, no, it's not time to have a, have a breath. Everything just floods in at one moment. These haunting visions of the face of every dead person I've seen. Things from my childhood, when I'd made mistakes, and you think, gee, this wave's gonna end soon, because if it doesn't, I'm gonna die. Lance had counselling and a six-month break from policing. It's a process that everyone, I think, has to go through in their own time. He says burnout is common in the force. And it always seems to be around the seven-year mark. We need to tell cops that this is going to happen and these are the warning signs. But he wouldn't give up on the career he loved. I hear people that say, you can't get over these things. I can never get over it. You can. Back on the beat, the biggest test of his career was yet to come. Next, the Napier siege. I was sure he was coming out. Absolutely sure he was coming out. Lance reveals what went wrong. My shot was hurt. 
crap. What have I done? And he meets Rob Mokaraka, a man who wanted police to shoot him. I used to watch police shoot Māori on the news. I thought, I'm a Māori, this should be easy. I received a phone call about midday saying that there was an event unfolding in Napier and you need to get down here. Gunshots rang out as heavily armed police landed. It was quite surreal. The airport was closed. There was a Hercules park beside the runway. The realisation hits you of how big this operation is. An operation to stop a madman. Jan Molinar had shot his neighbour and three police officers after a drug search went wrong. Shaken locals fled the area as they heard the fatal shots. Lance would oversee the negotiating team. I was thinking, well, it's just going to be another one of those incidents, you know, where somebody's on pee or, you know, and it'll all be over by around 11 o'clock, I guess. A few streets away. Initially, when you look at it, it just seems like a rather small house. Molinar was holed up in the house. He'd turned into a fortress. What sort of mood was he in? He was extremely angry. Uh, he was yelling and screaming. Every time police spoke to him, he'd come out shooting. My suggestion was that perhaps we should allow him to have at least two or three hours sleep so he can calm down. Lance says the commander disagreed, telling the team to phone Molinar on the hour, every hour. How did you feel about that call? Um, I was disappointed, to be honest. I felt like I'd been overawed. My personal opinion is we let people sleep through the night because the demons come in the dark. And if you try and keep people awake, uh, they'll make irrational decisions. Molinar kept firing. He was just rambling, ranting, and then something happened and his mood dropped. About eight in the morning, our phone went, which was really unusual, so he's calling us. He got quite um, sad, you could hear him sadness in his voice. Unbeknown to Lance, Molinar was receiving text messages from an ex-partner. Some of the messages on there were telling him basically to kill himself. Lance says detectives were reading those texts, but never passed them on to the negotiating team. Could that have changed things? It, it certainly would have changed our tactics, absolutely. I was very disappointed. There should have been a war room. We should have all sat around the table and said, here's our part, here's our part, and that wasn't happening. As the siege entered a second day, Lance knew he had a secret ally, Molinar's partner, Delwyn Keefe. The last option was to put Delwyn on the phone to say, I'm here, I'm waiting for you, come on out. Whose idea was that? It was my idea uh, and one that haunted me afterwards. He's either going to come out or he's going to shoot himself. And the response was, either way it's an end. So let's do it. We had a script for her to stick to. He's saying things like, I've really stuffed up, babe, I've really done some bad things. There's no coming back from this. She kept saying, yes, there is. Yes, you can get through this. Yes, there is. And then a shot was heard and it came back through the police radio. Shot fired, shot fired. Everyone knew what had happened. Uh, everyone knew. And uh, there was just silence. And straight away you go, oh, crap. What have I done? Lance had given Molinar the chance to say goodbye to Delwyn. He could then end his life. Did you feel like you'd failed? Yeah, absolutely. As a negotiator, you go to save lives, everyone's life. Even the life of the person that had started this whole thing, that had killed a colleague. Senior Constable Len Snee lay dead on Molinar's driveway. They managed to stop and pick up Len's body. The door opened and there was Len, um, you know, lying on the floor. I looked across and there was two military guys um, standing to attention. <laughs> it stuck with me forever. The aftermath of the siege could have set Lance back. Instead, it motivated him to improve police processes around negotiation. I'm very proud of my time in the police, to be honest, and I'm very proud of what they've done for me. So for 22 years, they looked after my family and I. Two years ago, Lance left the force and took with him some precious memories. And this is from uh, one of the victims' families that I dealt with. That's me, and you can see the uh, police hat type emblems on there. Lance had brought many cases to a close, but there was one man whose story had always haunted him. Have I told you how handsome Rob is? Actor Rob Mokaraka. 
Seven years ago, Rob threatened police and eventually they shot him in the chest. He forced uh, a police officer to shoot him. I wanted to know what would cause somebody to do it. Rob explains his turmoil using theatre. I was the happy-go-lucky funny guy who didn't show me how sad he was inside. I was deep in a storm. All the foundations of shame, guilt and failure had come swirling up. I didn't know what depression was. I didn't know what suicidal tendencies were. I was just living it. I just thought I deserved a violent end. That's because of shame, guilt, failure. Yes, yes. I just thought I deserved a violent end. <laughs> Growing up as a Māori kid, I used to watch police shoot Māori on the news. Yeah. And then I thought, I'm a Māori, this should be easy. To his surprise, Lance discovered that Rob's mental struggle reminded him of his own. It's me. The same. You go up and down, it's waves though, isn't it? Yeah. Failure, hero, failure, hero, failure, hero. I go through that too. We're two men who managed to get through the storm and got back up and are trying to heal. There's plenty of people out there to help you, but the only one that's going to really help you is you. Now, Lance coaches others in resilience. Like Rob, he wants us to be more open about our mental health. He's one brave man. I'm so proud, because I know how scary that is. Thank you. This country has got an epidemic, and Lance is part of the healing. Kick. How do you look at your life now? I'm very raw to, to life. You're better than Grandpa. I laugh more, and I cry more. I'm getting better as a dad. Well done. I'm getting better as a husband. There's no cynicism in me at all now. He joined the police for a bit of adventure, but he ended up saving lives, including his own. The long, lonely walks are no longer so lonely. There is hope. There is hope. So police offer support and counselling to their staff and monitor their workloads. They acknowledge Lance's views on the Napier siege, but say best practice was followed and decisions were based on all available facts. Now, Lance Burdett has written a book about his journey. Behind the Tape is out tomorrow. And if this story has raised any issues for you, call Lifeline on 0800 543 354.